Okay, we have about 13 minutes, uh, no, sorry, about 10 minutes uh, to address the second question. So, Katie, you want to start that one off? Absolutely. So, the next question we're going to discuss is how to determine the appropriateness of technology into education context. Um, so, considering that the main task and assignment in this course is to collaboratively create a 10 to 15 minute group video analyzing the relationship of the technology to teaching and learning opportunities as described in the HCHI model um, by Desjardins in 2001 and then 2005. Uh, so could we discuss using research deriving concepts and empirical evidence as the basis for the decision making within education context? And I'm not sure who would like to start us on that. Jeff, you want to start, and uh, then I think all three of us should probably uh, have something to say about it before we're finished. Sure. Uh, to me, this is the million-dollar question in education right now, today, and at least from where I stood and stand. Um, when I was a uh, consultant for our school board, um, this was what I wanted to happen. You know, was to, was to get to the point where we had technology as a mind tool, a learning tool that could extend the possibility of what teachers could presently do. Um, extend the voice of students, thin the walls of classrooms, enable lots of things to happen that can't happen with traditional ways of teaching in hopes of meet, meeting needs for a 21st century kind of learner. You know, and I don't, I don't like to use that term too much, but really, truly, there is a lot of shifting in what's expected out of individuals that are going to be out in the workplace or presently in the workplace from what it was when I came out from under my rock. So the long and the short of this for me is how do we get there? We're in a situation where a, a new teacher goes into a school or an old teacher goes into a school and, and sits down and works with another group of individuals and the solutions always stay the same. We end up throwing technology into the environment but the uses are still the same. There's really no kind of really extending possibilities because of it. And I think really the issue is comes down to what is, is, is noted here. We don't have both sides of the, of the coin. Those that come in and those that are already there see education and do pedagogical things, and that's done as they were themselves taught. And there's just so much more that they try to think of doing because they've got this wonderful technology in front of them, all this money spent, but they just reinvent the wheel and do the same thing with more technology because they haven't seen outside of the box to see what's possible. You know, they haven't gone to the, to the research, haven't gone to places where there's information that, that's backed with evidence that shows how you can change your practice using the technology. So we change a blackboard into a whiteboard. And that's about all that really happens. What comes out of it doesn't change. I was just thinking um, as you were talking there um, about a, a model that uh, essentially describes that kind of um, material. And I, I'm just going to put the, uh, the link for it um, onto the, the chat board so everybody can see it. Um, and then just very briefly, um, rather than taking some time to actually go, go through the process, uh, just talking about the SAMR model. Um, SAMR actually stands for um, four different steps that uh, Ruben Dib, whatever his last name is, can't remember, uh, Pen Pendatura, Pen Pentadura, sorry. Um, he has four steps in, the, in his model and he talks about the lowest level as being substitution. So the technology, and this is his description, technology acts as a direct tool substitute with no functional change. So if you think about a typewriter, back when we had a typewriter, and you start using a computer word processor as if it's a typewriter. So at the end of the line, you put a hard return, so it ends up going back to the beginning of the next line, all that kind of stuff, just in the same way that you would with a typewriter. His next step is augmentation. So the technology in this particular instance acts as a direct tool substitute with functional improvement. So what you can think about now is a typewriter. Um, you're using the computer now with a word processor, but the typewriter now has spell check added to it. All right, so it's it's got an augmented kind of 
feel to it, but essentially you're still using it as if it's a typewriter that's just a little bit more enhanced. So that's that that the interactive whiteboard, if you want, um, still being used essentially as an electronic chalkboard. It's it's that kind of an idea. Okay, the next step up, and this is when you actually get, according to um, Sam, our model, you're getting into a transformative kind of phase. So the third step is modification, S-A-M. Um, and in this particular instance, the technology allows for significant task redesign. So now what you're doing is starting to think about, hmm, so what can I do with this word processor that I could never do with a typewriter? Well, the most obvious thing is I can in embed graphics directly into uh, the word processor. Well, you know what? I can actually include voice recordings. I can include videos in my word processor document now as well. There is no way that a typewriter could do any of that kind of stuff. The, the fourth step that uh, Sam R model talks about is the R piece, the redefinition. So it allows for the recreate or for the creation of brand new tasks that were previously inconceivable. So that would be, let's just take a look at Google Docs, the word processor as a representation or a redefinition of what you could do with a typewriter. It bears to a large extent no similarities other than the fact that you are putting text on paper. However, the, the ability to actually have 15 people simultaneously uh, edit the document, etc., is a brand new re redefinition of what's actually going on with that particular kind of technology. So th those are kind of the ideas that I had when, when you first come up with <clears throat> the argument that you were talking about, Jeff. The interesting thing is to note what have I done to actually develop this argument? I went to a model that's been published within the literature. It's not my opinion. I'm looking at a model that is going to describe a situation, but it also uh, gives us some hypotheses for the future, some explanations that are going to have explanatory uh, power in the future when we come up with new technologies. Those are the kinds of things that I hope that you are actually going to be able to do. So go to the literature, find out what it says about, you know, redefinition, uh, the use of particular pieces within um, education context, etc. And then start applying them to your own situations within the problems that you have identified, etc. And I'm starting to go overboard here again. So Kate, um, please take me away. No, I, it was funny. As you were describing it, I was sitting here and the teacher in me, um, as you were describing the model, was then going to the next step in, in my process of finding examples of it in the classroom. So I was thinking about, you know, um, writing and how we have so many, you know, before the children would use pencils to write. And I was thinking about using that model with real examples and then taking it to the next step, which is you know, a, a part of this process, but they need to have that foundational research, which is, um, again, why I was posting um, the library resources as a, a tool for our students to start using, um, to start going out and researching properly um, some of the explanations that are out there so that they can help form new opinions. Because essentially, uh, we need to start creating and coming up with solutions to our problems um, by starting with a strong foundation from the research, the most current research that's out there. So that's where, where my thought process was going. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I would call that, as I've said in the chat line here, that that is evidence-based decision-making. So you're actually going out, finding the evidence that will support the argument that you're trying to make. Um, yeah, go so ahead. Often, uh, we've got to fi finish this off. So I, I'm just uh, calling Okay. To attention the short. time limit. <laughs> I was just going to say, so often, you know, we go back to our, our first experience, our own experience. Um, and so it's really a shift that has to occur in our thinking to move away from um, looking at how we were taught and then thinking that that's how we should teach and thinking, um, you know, so we really have to move away, uh, especially in this course, to now um, a different way of thinking and a different way of of applying that knowledge and so hopefully our students will 
um, start realizing that their opinions um, are not as critical as research and then coming up with new solutions. That that's kind of takes me right to what I was thinking about, the idea of, of their own opinions of things. And I know we got to rush through this, and it's important that um, we are succinct. The one thing that comes to my mind is sometimes we, we think we have an opinion, because, again, we're looking for the right and wrong answer in things, and, and we know that the right and wrong answer should be, well, we need technology embedded in this because it's in a technology course. There's an awful lot of things that people carry around inside them as a belief structure that even though they'll articulate it to be one way, it'll actually be another. And, and work like that done by Ertmer um, is something that really brought this to my attention, that sometimes when we uh, ask a teacher, do you use technology in the classroom? They'll say, oh, yeah, we use it quite a bit. And uh, we ask them, do you integrate it? Is it integrated into your lesson? Well, I think so. I, I think I'm doing integration. I went to this uh, course uh, two weeks ago with uh, my consultant, and he gave me some information on how to use the technology. So I'm up and running. And then when people actually go in and, and view them in the classroom, and there's actually some research done, they're truly not integrating. They're truly going back to the same place. Uh, they're stuck in the lower levels of the SAMR model, and that's where they stay. It's because they don't know how to open their minds up necessarily. Um, and the only way you can do that is to go to somebody who's done some research about what resistance and what barriers people have to the adoption of technology as a, as a changing tool. Um, so it, again, it goes back to that same idea of needing to know what you don't know. And if you don't know it, you can't find it yourself. It needs to be from beyond you someplace, which where the research comes in handy to, to give us some ideas. People have postulated questions, formatted them, gone out there and tried to find an answer. Other people have tried to refute them. There's a whole process there that actually leads to the ability to make change for the individual. And if, if we just stay drawing from ourselves all the time, we're not going to be able to go up on the SAMR model. Uh, we won't know what the concerns, like the whole idea of concerns-based adoption models can't even be addressed if we, have to, if we don't know what the concerns are. So it just really helps, I think, if we do some research along the way. Okay, thank you both of you very, very much. Um, I think I'm going to have to cut this off. At